Hi everyone. I am here today to chat about how guest blogs can help you land TV appearances, book deals, paid speaking. Guest blogs really are like the gateway drug <laughs> for great publicity. And I know it because I've lived it. I got both of my book deals as a direct result of my blogging. Those were commercial publishing deals. One of them had a nice advance. <laughs> I have gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars in paid speaking over the last decade in large part because of my blogging. I've had TV appearances, even a weekly television spot for a number of years, all because of blogging. And many of my clients write guest blogs for places like Entrepreneur and Forbes and Inc. and uh, Working Mother. I've had a client who recently wrote for Shape Magazine. We've got clients in all different industries writing guest blogs. And one of the things I find myself talking about most often from a strategic standpoint is should you write for as many places as possible and rack up as many of those big name bylines as you can, or should you focus on one specific place? Hi, Jana. And people ask this probably because they see that I write in one or two specific places. So I'm a contributor at Forbes where I write about sports business, which is sort of my previous career, and I also write for Entrepreneur about personal branding and publicity topics. I formerly was a contributor at Fast Company and then moved over to Entrepreneur. So what I tell people about guest blogging is that I think in the beginning, you guest blog in a number of different places, especially if we're talking like beginning, beginning. If you haven't really written anywhere but your own site, you're gonna wanna find some key niche blogs or publications that have online sites in your specific topic area. And as a matter of fact, I think you'll find that sometimes you get far better results in terms of leads and clients from the more niche publications. So even though it sounds like this huge deal to write for a Forbes or an Inc or an entrepreneur, or maybe it's you know writing for the online site for Glamour or Men's Health or something like that, although those sound like a big deal, I can tell you as somebody who's written for all of those and many more, that um, it might not produce the results that you think, that actually writing for a more niche publication that is full of your ideal client can sometimes produce greater leads. But that's topic for another day. What I want to talk about is strategically, how do you guest blog in a way that you get things like book deals and paid speaking and TV appearances? Probably the one I get asked most about is paid speaking because I get the vast majority of my paid speaking from guest blogging um, and really from being a contributor at Forbes. That has over the years, and I've been a paid public speaker for a decade now, been the number one way I get my speaking leads is through my blogs for Forbes. And now that I've sort of used myself as a guinea pig over the years and then worked with a number of clients, what I have found is that clients tend to want to write for a lot of places. They wanna rack up the logos. They write for Forbes once, they write for Entrepreneur once, they write for Inc. once, or you know, maybe they write for Mind Body Green once, and Shape once, and Working Mother once, whatever those key publications are in your niche, and then they feel like they're done. Um, as a matter of fact, I quite often have clients who get offers to contribute more regularly to some of these big publications, and they don't take the publication up on the offer. They've already written for them once, and they say, well, I wrote there once, and I didn't really get anything from it. Okay, well, I didn't get all the stuff I got from writing once for Forbes. <laughs> I got it because I've written for Forbes for five years total. I wrote for them for two years to begin with, and out of those two years, got um, a book deal with a big advance. I got tons of paid speaking, including my very first paid speaking gig, um, and I eventually got a job offer from ESPN. I was working full-time as a corporate attorney, and I was writing for Forbes on the side, and it ended up changing my career path, and I got this full-time job offer from ESPN. That did not come from writing one blog for Forbes, okay? So I wrote for them for two years. I went to work at ESPN. I've now been back writing at Forbes for another three years, and I routinely get opportunities from that, but it's from writing for one publication over and over. And so I am now of the belief that you write for 
maybe multiple publications, especially in the beginning, you're going to start at like smaller ones and you're going to work your way up to the bigger ones. But let's say you've made it to the bigger ones. I would try out a few and see where you feel like you're getting the best results from in terms of um, the number of views that you're getting or how much it's getting shared on social media or how much people are responding to your post about it on social media. You know, look for the one that seems to be getting you maybe a little more traction than the others and then go all in, okay? I would sample a few places and then try to find the right spot for you and go all in and contribute for them on a regular basis. That is where all the great opportunities have come from, not only for me, but for my clients who have committed to being contributors. It is writing for that outlet over and over about a niche topic area. So for me at Forbes, it's sports business. It's um, And in the beginning, it was really just legal issues in sports. I was still practicing law then. Um, I have branched out a little bit since then. Hi, Judy. Um, but it is having those niche areas. So like for entrepreneur, I really only write about publicity and personal branding. And I'm essentially guinea pig testing that. Like if I treat that the same way I've treated Forbes all these years, will it produce the same results? And the early results are that, yes, I think it will. And I think there's a number of reasons why that works. These sites are going to have tremendous SEO value. So when an event organizer is looking for a speaker, because they probably know the topics they want to have on panels and for keynotes, and if there isn't someone who comes to their mind immediately or who is someone on their organizing committee recommends or whatever, then they're going to get online and search. And sites like Forbes or Entrepreneur are going to come up ahead of your website. I don't care how much you're writing about it on your website. For most people, writing for those outlets is going to come up first. And when you come up over and over again, okay, so when they search, for example, um, college football facilities, okay, that's something I've written on a lot for Forbes over the years. I'm not going to just come up once in the search results. I'm going to come up maybe a dozen times. Maybe I'm even on the first page three times. I don't know because I didn't search it before I did this live, but um, I know for a fact there are topics around the business of college sports in particular where when you Google them, I don't just come up once, I come up multiple times because that's my niche and I've stuck to it and I've written about it over and over and over over the years. Who do you think they want to have come speak? Someone that's written about it over and over and over or someone who wrote about it once somewhere, okay? They're going to pick the person who that seems like their area. They're an expert on it because they're writing about it constantly. And by doing it for one big publication like that, I think that you tend to come up in the search results and it hits the person in the face a little more. Hi, Kim. So that's why I say to, sure, sample out different outlets. Sure, if you want to be able to put on your website logos for 10 different publications. Um, I get that that has some marketing value, but if your goal is to attract paid speaking, to be an expert on television, to maybe get a book deal, if you want to be one of the experts in your field, you want to be the next Tony Robbins, the next Gary V, the next Marie Forleo, the next Gabby Bernstein, whatever, you want to be that next person, let me tell you that they all did it by creating tons of content around one niche area, okay? And my suggestion on top of that is not only choose your niche and create a ton of content around that niche, but find a place to do it where you can get noticed and spend a lot of time in that place. Instead of spreading yourself out all over all these different outlets, hi Vanessa, pick the one that's working and stick with it. I am telling you that nearly every amazing thing that has happened to me has happened from writing for Forbes. Even though I've written for Men's Health and Glamour and Golf Digest and Fox Sports and ESPN, I was even full-time at ESPN for a number of years. Um, I can tell you that the best opportunities I've gotten have been for writing for Forbes. Now that might not be the right place for you to write, but I tested different things and I can tell you what worked was Forbes. And so my long-term plan is to con continue to contribute 
to Forbes because that's what works for me. That's what works for my niche. That's how I know people find me. So I encourage you to look for those guest blogging opportunities because I do think that they have tremendous value and can lead to enormous opportunities. They are not going to happen from one guest blog, okay? I know very few people who one guest blog blew them up or did something amazing for their business. It is not going to happen with one guest blog. I also don't think it's going to happen with one guest blog in five different places. It's going to happen with consistent content creation over time. And I think your best shot at it is to find that outlet that's the right outlet for you and go all in and be a contributor and write on a niche topic over and over and over and over. Okay, it's a long-term play. These people you see that you want to be, um, you know, the Gary Vee's and the Marie Forleo's of the world, they didn't do it with one video or with one guest blog or one anything. As a matter of fact, I read an interview Marie Forleo did and she talked about how she had to like pinpoint the turning point for her. It was when she decided to do a regular video show and set a day and time every week and became consistent about it. So like the overarching, like big advice I can give you is consistently create content. But I wanted to drill down further with this advice and tell you I've tested it over the years with myself and with other people and the people I know who get the biggest and the best opportunities and become that go-to expert in their field usually found one place that was a sweet spot for them and they became a contributor and they were creating content over and over and over and over and over in that one place. Okay. <laughs> I haven't seen any questions come in, but certainly if you have questions, leave them. If you end up watching this on the replay, you can still leave a question and I will get to it and answer it. And if you've got something you would love to see me cover in an upcoming video, let me know because I have decided that instead of trying to do these like big grand webinars and all these slides and you know, whatever, sending you all these email reminders to come show up for my webinar, I am going to do a lot more little mini trainings here on Facebook Live. And uh, I would love to know the things that you want to know more about that you think I know about. <laughs> um, Hope said, what if your niche is not business oriented? That's fine. You just have to find the outlets that are right for whatever your niche is. Maybe your niche is knitting. Do you know how many magazines and outlets there are dedicated to knitting? <laughs> um, there are publications out there literally for everything. And if you don't believe me, go to a Barnes and Noble and look through the magazine section. There are publications for everything, and that's just print magazines, okay? There's 10 times that when you start talking about online publications, so um, whatever it is. Now, I have said business outlets over and over because that happens to be where my both of my niches are, my sports business stuff that I do and my publicity stuff that I do, but there are publications and online outlets for every niche that you can think of, so find the right ones for you, not not necessarily the ones that I'm saying, I'm just using them as examples. Hi, Pierre, thank you so much for the kind comments. Um, Vanessa said, do you feel Harrow is a good resource for guest blogging? I do, well, I take that back, okay. Not a good resource for guest blogging. It's not often that you see somebody, and if people don't know what Harrow is, Harrow stands for Help a Reporter Out. Um, it's a great way to find reporters and writers who are looking for sources and to pitch yourself as an expert source to get quoted or featured by someone else who's writing, whereas a guest blog is something you're writing, I don't often see guest blogging opportunities posted on there. That's more journalists and writers who are looking for sources. So I think Harrow's great, and I think there are great opportunities there, but I don't think that's necessarily a good resource for guest blogging. Um, really to find guest blogging opportunities, you need to figure out what outlets, what publications is your ideal client already reading, already consuming. Don't try to bring them somewhere new. Find them where they already are. Uh, just ask, like, what are your favorite blogs to read or what sites do you spend a lot of time on? And then just Google something like um, Mind Body Green Submission Guidelines. Whatever the name of the publication is, submission guidelines or contributor guidelines. And I'd say... 
80% of all publications have a page for that because they probably got tired of people emailing them and asking them. So, <laughs> um, so most of them have their actual guidelines up now. So that's the best way to figure out how to submit. Sometimes you can submit a pitch, which means you're just telling them what your idea for the piece is, like a suggested headline and a few bullet points about what it would be about. Um, some want a full draft, but they'll usually tell you which one they want. Uh, Judy said, pod, there are also podcasts for micro niches like knitting. Yes, there literally are content outlets out there for every topic you could possibly think of, I promise. Um, and actually sometimes the more niche, the better. The easier it is to reach your ideal client or customer, the more niche it is. And that's why I say sometimes you'll actually get better results writing for a more niche publication than if you did write for one of these huge big name publications. Go where your people are. That's the most important thing I can tell you. Um, Vanessa said thoughts, so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Vanessa. So nice to see you here. I feel like I haven't talked to you in a while. <laughs> um, okay, I don't see any other questions, and I don't want to make you guys just listen to me ramble on. But like I said, I want to do more of these mini trainings. Oh, I saw another question. I'll finish my thought. I want to do more of these mini trainings. So if you have something you want me to talk about, send me a message, post it here, and I will add it into my list of things because I am going to start doing these like every couple of days. Um, Betsy says there are a ton of travel publications out there. They're more general. I'm looking for niche specific Florida, Caribbean, Southern travel. Yeah, I'm telling you, there are outlets for everything. Um, and the more niche, the better. I'm telling you, I promise you. And Betsy knows that. Betsy was just at a retreat that I hosted that was just for freelance writers, all of whom happen to be travel writers. Some of them do some other things too, but, uh, we just had a retreat in Breckenridge, Colorado that was Amazing. I had so much fun with them. And we talked about everybody's niche. We actually did a whole um, like hot seat workshop where people checked out each other's websites and social media before we went to the retreat. And then each person had a turn on the hot seat and everyone else in the room went around and said what they thought that person's niche was based on just looking at their website and their social media. And I've done that exercise before at a workshop and I thought it was so insightful because at the end of the day, your brand is what other people think it is. Okay. Now you might have something that you want to be your personal brand. This is how you learn that maybe you're not there yet. When everybody goes around and they tell you what they think based on just your website and your social media, you might find you're a little off of where you want to be. And then you can be more intentional about creating that brand you really want. So I have another retreat coming up in Breckenridge at the end of September for fall foliage. I'm so excited about the fall foliage. And we still have two spots, maybe three open for that retreat. And we're going to be doing that hot seat again. So if that sounds exciting to you, get in touch with me and I'll give you more details about the retreat. All right. I am going to get out of here. If you have something you want me to talk about next time, shoot me a message, leave me a comment, let me know, and I will jump back on soon for another one. Thank you so much for everyone who showed up live. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day.